Great sevens, welcome to lesson 7.2, the conditions for confederation. What factors in British North America led to confederation? What was happening here that we have this push towards creating a new country? So stick around and let's learn something. All right, so you heard it in the opening sequence. This is lesson 7.2. The question is, what factors in British North America led to confederation? There was a lot going on here, people. So what were those main factors that were leading uh, into confederation? Well, by 1858, there were seven colonies in British North America. Each colony had its own history and each colony had its own identity. We had Vancouver Island, we had British Columbia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and then we had the province of Canada, which was split into Canada West and Canada East. Now, they are British North America, so they do have some things in common, like they are part of the British Empire. They took their style of government from Britain. Um, each colony had First Nations, and the majority of the people living in each of those colonies were of British origin, except for the fact, let's say, maybe in Canada East, where the majority probably would have been Canadien, so they would have been of French origins. But nonetheless, these are what all of these colonies had in common. And it was around the 1850s, here in like 1858 even, that they started thinking about maybe it's best if we joined into one union, one single country, and see if that will kind of work for us, okay? We've got some issues. We've got political deadlock. We can't seem to agree on much in the province of Canada. The trading partners that we currently have as colonists, things are starting to change. And we're starting to show a little bit of worry to our neighbors to the south. And maybe we should start thinking of defending ourselves. How can we best defend ourselves? So let's deal with the political deadlock first. In the 1850s, I told you this is going to happen. People are once again unhappy. So if you've been paying attention to earlier lessons, you know that, well, this is a common thing. People are unhappy. The English, first of all, in the province of Canada, the English, they made up the majority of the people in the legislative assembly, which means that the Canadiens are the minority and they're getting outvoted on all kinds of political matters. So the Canadian, they're, th they're thinking, well, you know what, maybe, maybe we shouldn't even be a part here. Maybe we should actually leave and make up our own thing. So there was a reformer, Louis Lafontaine, who disagreed with this. And he was so convinced that they could make this system in the province of Canada work that he fought for it. And he was a, he was a really good guy for the Canadiens. He was a super strong report, a supporter of the French language rights. Um, and he was saying that it's actually the English who are divided. He was saying that the reformers and the Tories, the conservatives who were in upper Canada, Canada West, they are actually divided and they are going to fall. So uh, La Fontaine joins forces with somebody by the name of Robert Baldwin, and they create the Great Ministry, which improves laws and improves the life of many people living in the province of Canada. Not only that, but they also um, made sure that the responsible government that was in existence now, pushed those powers to the elected assemblies, okay? Problem was though, things didn't run as smoothly as the great ministry had hoped. So here we are in the 1850s, now this, this rivalry between these assemblies and between these parties is starting to cause political deadlock so that nothing is moving forward. And one of the things that was taking place was rep by pop, representation by population, which basically means elected members all represent the same number of people. 
So the larger your population, the more representatives you are going to have. And this system did not exist in Canada. And this was the problem. This is what they wanted. They wanted this rep by pop to take place. What was happening instead is that Canada East and Canada West, they all had the same number of seats. But look at their populations. Their populations are going to be much different. And the way it was set up to have the same number of seats definitely worked in Canada West's favor earlier on in our story of Canada in the 1840s. Because Canada West, as you remember, had this much smaller population. So this was great, right? So we are now, if we're a small population, we still have the same say as Canada East, which has a larger population. So that was in the 1840s. But 10 years later, we see that the population of Canada West is increasing and surpassing that of Canada East. So now they still have the same seats. So now Canada West wants representation by population because they will have much more say. And of course, now that the now that the the shoes on the other foot or whatever the saying is, Canada East is going to object to this because Canada East has the same amount of seats now because their population is smaller, but they still have the same amount of seats. Obviously, they're going to object to rep by pop because then they would lose seats. So we're in this constant political deadlock that uh, that is there. Now, political deadlock, I want to take a look at some of the parties that we have during this time in our history. The first party is the Clear Grit Party. This is an English speaking party led by George Brown. And they were a group of reformers, and they wanted a more democratic government, they wanted the people to have more say. Okay, the next party, we have the Le Rouge, the Reds. Um, you can tell by the name, they're French. Antoine Dorian, I think is how you say it. He was the leader of this party, and he wanted independence for Quebec. He wanted to break away from British rule. Le Bleu, this is also a French party led by George Etienne Cartier. And he was opposite of Le Rouge, and he did not want independence for Quebec. Instead, he wanted to cooperate with the English. So work together and cooperate with them. The liberal conservatives, led by John A. Macdonald, you may have heard of him before. This is an English-speaking party, and he was in favor of cooperating with the Canadiens. So he wanted to work with the French to build a better system of government. And then finally, we have our independence an independent can be either language, French or English. They're independent, so they have no leader, and they vote as they please. However they want to vote, they vote. So political deadlock is problem number one, pushing us towards confederation. Number two is our shifting trade partners. You remember from many lessons ago, we talked about the mercantile system. Or raw goods are going to Britain from the colonies and the finished goods are returning to the colonies. The British did not tax any of the imports, which is a really good thing for both sides. Okay, That made colonial goods especially popular in Britain because the costs were down. Goods from other countries and from other areas of the, of the planet, they were going to be taxed and this is going to drive the price of goods up. But if you're getting colonial goods, things are going to be a little bit cheaper. But in 1846, Britain decides to end the mercantile system. Their manufacturing is increasing and improving. And now they are starting to sell their goods in other places throughout the world. So if they're wanting to sell in other places around the world, they are going to then have to reduce the amount of tax on these goods that are coming in. So they reduce the taxes on the other imports coming from other countries. In turn, those countries that are getting stuff from Britain are reducing their taxes. This is free trade. The colonies now can't rely on Britain for selling their goods. And in fact, the British even start to question, why are we even spending money on the colonies to help govern them and to help defend them? What's the purpose of that? Because Britain ends their mercantilism with the colonies, they look towards the United States and they start trading with the states. And they sign a reciprocity agreement in 1854, which means fish 
timber, which is lumber, grain can flow back and forth over the border without having to pay taxes and without having to pay dues. And this is good for business. But the U.S., after a while, they felt like eh, they're not getting a fair deal, right? They should be getting a better deal. Not sure what could be a better deal, but they felt as though they could get a better deal. So they, they end the treaty, the reciprocity uh, trade agreement in 1864. And now there's an economic crisis. Britain reduced their taxes on foreign imports. The U.S. ended this trade deal. How are we going to, how are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? Like, should we enter union? If we don't enter union, then we're going to have some major problems by entering the union that means that we can trade with each other the colonies can easily trade with each other if you enter into union canada east and canada west now have access to the maritime ports which is awesome because now we can get our stuff all over the all over the place okay the maritime ports are then going to get more customers there'll be a tax-free change because we're tax-free exchange because we're all within the union and we can build a strong market here at home Sounds like a great idea, okay? Um, make your strong economy local. And that's what they were trying to do. The third reason why Confederation was so uh, popular was defense. So when they ended the reciprocity agreement, there were some sour relations that existed. And the colonies, rightfully so, were worried that... Um, the U.S. is going to send their army north to take over the British colonies of North America because there was a civil war that was happening down in the States. That started in 1861. This is when the Civil War begins. This is over slavery and the power of individual states to make their own laws. So you can see here on the map, now we have a divided United States. The colonies, obviously, we've we heard this in, in previous lessons, they were against slavery. So they supported the northern states, but they were British. And Britain needed the textile industries cotton from the south, who were in favor of slaves, they needed that textile industry to survive. So it seemed as if the British were supporting the south. So therefore, the northern states assumed that the colonies, because it's British North America, would then follow along and follow the British lead. Are you confused yet? If so, that's good, because it is very confusing. So this is what happens when people don't talk to each other, right? This is what happens, okay? So they were worried about defending North America. If we are together, maybe we can defend British North America a little bit more or we could be stronger. If the North won, and the North thought that the colonies were supporting slavery down in the South, would then the, the North turn and go towards invading the colonies of British North America? Some wanted to do that, right? And they wanted to punish the British for supporting the Southern states. What better way to punish them than to invade British North America? The United States also had something called Manifest Destiny. And some people in the States believe that it was their duty, their destiny to control all of North America. Well, if you hold that belief, then, well, your next step is going to be to invade the British colonies. So the colonies now have every right in the world to be kind of worried and kind of scared. So they felt that individually they would not be able to survive an American invasion. But if they actually joined forces together, maybe they can kind of defend this, this, uh, these colonies, right? And what was also happening at the time were the Fenian raids, I, the Irish wanting freedom from Britain overseas back in the United Kingdom. So how are we going to punish the British? Well, they've got colonies in British North America. Let's attack the border towns of British North America. So uh, the Fenians, these were Irish living in, uh, in the 13 colonies. They went in and they raided these border towns be only because they were British. So we've got political deadlock. We've got the defending of the British North American colonies. And then we have... Um, 
the shifting trade partners. Everything was kind of working in a perfect storm leading into confederation as, as a way to strengthen the union. This is where we're at in our story of Canada. So let's talk about the railway revolution for a quick minute here. So along the same time as the idea of union was taking place, the railway revolution was also taking place. And this is in the mid 1800s, where rail was booming. By 1861, the colonies had just over 3000 kilometers of railroad, which is a ton. And before any railway kind of existed, the colonies were were on their own, and it made it difficult to trade, it made it difficult to sell, it made it tif uh, difficult for movement of, of, the, of the citizens, but the railway was changing all of that. It was connecting uh, towns and cities all the way from the east to the west, back and forth, and this was really beneficial for business because you can easily move goods. And the colonists of British North America, they wanted to connect Halifax with Canada West. They wanted to be able to in Canada West, the people wanted to be able to get to the port of Halifax, and the people of Halifax wanted to open up uh, the colonies, especially that of, of Canada West, to more trade. It made business sense. But the problem is, it's not cheap to lay down uh, rail. It's very expensive. So Canada West couldn't afford to do it. Obviously, Halifax is going to be uh, unable to do it. Nova Scotia is not going to have the money to do this. But if everyone in the union contributes to this project, this is something that can actually happen. Okay, and we can build this railway. So all these things are leading up. So as we're entering union, we now need to think of maybe a capital city, we know a union is going to take place in some way, shape or form, it's only a matter of time. So now we have to prep a capital city. So there's a problem. Everybody wants to be the capital. Toronto wants to be the capital. Quebec City wants to be the capital. Montreal wants to be the capital. Timbuktu wants to be the capital. Everybody wants to be the capital. It's a very prestigious thing to have, and that's what you want. But nobody obviously could agree on where this capital is going to be. So they threw around all kinds of ideas, yeah, keeping it in Toronto for two years, then moving it to Quebec City for two years, and back and forth that way. But this political deadlock was really... Uh, hindering the choice of a capital. So the Legislative Assembly in 1857 goes to a deal breaker. Okay, who are we going to use? We're going to use Queen Victoria. So over in England, Queen Victoria, some people say that she just blindly picked the spot on the map of British North America and others argue that no, she, she made a conscious decision. She picked a small town called By Town. Bytown is later known as Ottawa. The Bytown area in Ottawa still exists today. You can go and visit it, the Bytown Market and all that kind of stuff. Excellent restaurants. Um, but back during this time in 1857, Bytown was a small logging town. And people were like, what is she doing? Like, she's crazy for choosing this. But why did she choose this? We need to take a look at the why. And she had some, some solid reasons to choose Bytown, later named Ottawa, as the capital city of Canada. It's on the border between Canada East and Canada West, which is Quebec and Ontario today. It had three rivers. So it's very easy for the colonists to get to Bytown. And it was far from American attack. That's one of the big things that they were worried about. What will happen if the United States goes through with their manifest destiny or they decide to attack Canada? Well, they are going to go into the capital. So let's move the capital a little bit further north. It's going to be more difficult for the Americans to attack it and it will be easier for us to defend it. So on December 31st, 1857, Ottawa becomes the official capital and it still exists today. All right, I want you to head over to your notebook and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.